I'm so pleased to be able to introduce my panel. I have Roman Wild to, the, to my right. Roman is a CPA from Illinois, and he is an em emeritus faculty member of the Chicago Booth School of Business, who's retired after 45 years on the faculty there. Within the last academic year, he's been visiting professor at the Stern School of Business at NYU, program fellow at Stanford Law School, and visiting professor at Cox School of Business at SMU. In the academic year of 2012-2013, he'll visit the Randy School, the Rady School, sorry, of Management at the University of California, San Diego. Paul Virtue needs no introduction. Dan Siciliano, you're aware of, and it needs no introduction. And I also have Rob Cooper, who's a partner at uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers for, and has been with them for the past 25 years. Rob is currently on tour with the PwC National Office. In this role, Rob oversees independent reviews of their audit work for SEC registrants reviewed by the P PCAOB in order to access compliance with firm and professional auditing standards. I'd like to give you an overview and a roadmap for what we'd like to accomplish within our panel. I think we're going to lead off with Paul, and who's going to discuss a little bit about the legislative history um, in regards to company obligations and I-9 compliance obligations upon, uh, upon employers. We'll then fo be followed by Dan, who will talk about the executive branch enforcement issues. Of course, we need to, to bring in the, the new Senate bill and to be able to highlight important reforms and penalty measures that are being introduced in the bill. And the purpose really of that is to be able to bring that into light as to how that will now apply and be incorporated within the materiality clause of, of Sarbanes-Oxley, as well as items such as the whistleblower statute requirements within Dodd-Frank and how there are some mirrored, mirrored um, aspects of that within the Senate bill. We're then going to also then look again at Sox, Dodd-Frank, and SEC Fast Five, the books and records. And I think for the first time what we'd like to do is to be able to bring in an auditor's perspective. That's where Rob and Roman will be coming into play. And I, uh, what, as lawyers, we so often don't understand and don't know how to react to audit letters that we receive. And perhaps as immigration attorneys, we just sit there dumbfounded and say, what do I do with this? And it's been reported that oftentimes immigration lawyers will just put it aside and ignore it. And that's really not what we should be doing. And I think if we take a look at the new Senate bill, it's not a service to our clients to ignore that. So I think what we're going to talk about is how this new bill will create and mandate immigration compliance and how it has now become part of the entire compliance structure that, uh, that companies can no longer just ignore or just uh, brush off as a form that needs to be properly filled out. So without further ado, Paul, help us. talk. Talk to me about legislative requirements and, and legislative enforcement measures uh, for immigration compliance. Thanks, Chris. And, and I promise to do this quickly because I'm sure you're tired of hearing from me. But uh, in 1986, as we mentioned on the last panel, Congress was dealing with how to address a population of undocumented uh, people that had grown to about 6 million. And um, one of the ways was to uh, close the back door, as Senator Simpson liked to say, by beefing up the border. Um, the other was by addressing what uh, Congress believed at the time was a draw factor, uh, employment in the United States, and, and how best to address that. And there were debates back and forth, and actually there were, that bill had to go through several Congresses before it was ultimately enacted in 1986 and became effective in 19. 87, and what Congress decided was we would have sanctions in, in the forms of uh, civil money penalties as well as criminal penalties for pattern or practice of hiring undocumented, of employing undocumented workers knowingly. 
Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there had been discussion about whether to have employment verification be an affirmative defense or an obligation of all employers, and Congress settled on having that um, be, an, be an obligation on the, on the part of employ all employers uh, for all new hires after November 1st of 1986. Uh, so that, that's the generic statute that we, that we had. At the same time, uh, even, even back then, there was a, a concern about um, fraudulent documents and, and um, how employers would have to become document experts in order to be able to enforce this, this law. And so Congress at that time authorized four different pilot programs for testing out different systems uh, for addressing this issue, trying to, trying to use technology and database, existing immigration and, and social security databases to address the issue. And that was called the Basic Pilot Program. And that was the only one of the four. I don't, uh, I don't even want to get into the others, but that was the only one of the four that basically had any legs and had really much promise in terms of, of a system that would allow employers to get an answer pretty readily about whether somebody's authorized to be employed or not. Um, so we saw that develop over time, and, and that's the system, the basic pilot uh, system that, that ultimately became E-Verify that we know uh, today. The, um, the other th thing that happened in, in terms of the legislation was that um, it became effective in, in 1987. Uh, for the first year and a half, INS was under um, direction to uh, have an, educa an employer education program. So we were really educating employers and not issuing fines, but actually issuing warning notices, um, focusing more on education for employers than on fining employers. But when we started to find employers in around 1998 or so, concerns were raised to Congress that, hey, we're, you know, we're really being dinged for some really minor errors that we have on this I-9 form. It's a one-page form, but it's not the easiest thing to uh, comprehend. Um, you have employers all across the lot who have different uh, levels of sophistication. Um, we really need to address this issue. That's what Congress was hearing. So um, during the markup the, on the uh, House side of the 19, 1996 Act, which ultimately became, became the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996. Um, Congressman Sonny Bono, during that, we had about two weeks of markup on this bill, introduced a bill that provided for, uh, that required um, the INS at that time to give notice to an employer if there were technical or procedural errors on the I-9 form and to give the employer an opportunity, 10-day opportunity, to correct those errors. What that gave rise to was a need for the Immigration Service, and as I said, we used to, we used to actually regulate back then. We would, um, it required us to make, come up with a definition of what these procedural and technical errors um, were. And so in 1997, we did that. When I was Executive Associate Commissioner for Programs, we published um, some guidelines for our officers on, um, first of all, the exercise of discretion not to fine uh, in cases of technical and procedural errors, but also on what is a technical and procedural error, what is a substantive error, and, and how those, those uh, should be addressed. So that memo actually forms the basis for the, uh, the enforcement guidelines that uh, DHS follows even today. Um, a couple of recent changes are that we have a new I-9 form, so all the terminology is not going to relate, you know, correspond directly. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So they're in, in the process of publishing a new regulation uh, in connection with the, um, the new I-9 form to address that issue, to address the procedural errors. And then in the Gang of Eight bill, we have even a different terminology now, de minimis violations and inadvertent violations that somebody's going to have to deal with in terms the the uh, administration will have to deal with in terms of how to define uh, how to define those but that sort of brings us up to you know what the enforcement has been where how we came to be here from the 1986 act and gives us an opportunity a little later in our panel to talk about what we might expect from the uh, the senate bill
Back to you, Chris. Thanks, Paul. Dan, as time has moved on, we also looked during the Bush and the Obama administrations for enforcement through the, the executive branch. Can you please lead us through or step us through some of those efforts? Sure. In fact, what I think I'll do is let me set a framework and then maybe we'll jump around. I want to keep it brief for fear of cannibalizing my keynote later. <laughs> um, but uh, so first let me pose a question, which is a way to distinguish what a lot of this compliance is. And I, I use the word compliance because I think we'll agree if you read the bill, uh, if you look at the language that's going to be used moving forward, the phrase compliance is going to be used a lot more in its kind of all caps sense. So here's a couple of things. Uh, first, the question that you think the current compliance regime might ask and that the bill might propose is the following, but I'm going to suggest it's not. Are you doing a good job of avoiding the employment of unauthorized workers? When you ask most people, what the whole system's in place for, they'll say, well, yeah, that's the litmus test question, right? Isn't, am I doing a good job of avoiding the employment of those who are not authorized to work? Or is it the following question? Is your paperwork and your process sufficiently in order to demonstrate that you engaged in the pre prescribed effort to avoid the employment of unauthorized workers? These are two very separate questions. I would suggest that the entire regime already is focused on the latter, um, though the flash bang of enforcement that we read in the news is obviously focused on the former. And the way you read the bill now, I would suggest it even more so shifts to this idea of process as compliance and the violation of process being the point at which you invoke all sorts of liabilities. So let me give you an example from the real world of places that we lose sleep and worry about, and that is FCPA. FCPA is harder to trip up on than the current I-9 compliance regime and certainly than the current Senate bill. Why? Because underlying the ability to accrue liability under FCPA, by and large, you have to have some sort of actual bad act. So it is not the case in the world of I-9s, as contemplated here or currently, that you have to have employed someone who is unauthorized in order to run into trouble. That's not the story, right? Under FCPA, someone has to have alleged some sort of violation of FCPA in order for you to kind of get moving down the train. Now, mind you, it can be quite minor. Uh, you know, $800 of flowers given as a gift in Vietnam prior to a transaction, and boom, $20 million later of, you know, investigations and fines. But there had to have been an act. There had to have been a violation of the underlying objective, which was to avoid corruption in the payment of, uh, you know, I illicit or inappropriate uh, money to government agents or otherwise, right? Under the current structure, and certainly under the bill, you don't have to have had the quote unquote bad act. No one has to have been employed in an authorized fashion. So what does this mean? That means that this is a lot more like SEC enforcement or like taxes. Just because you actually paid your taxes doesn't mean you don't have to file in a timely and complete and accurate fashion your tax return, even if you're getting money back. It is a crime over time, and it compounds itself if it goes on for too long, if you paid all of your taxes, if you paid too many taxes, if you paid twice your taxes but you didn't file your tax returns. And same thing with the SEC. So at a books and records level, if you complied with all of the rules in place, if you never violated a single exchange rule, if you did everything the SEC was supposed to do but you did not file your 10K or your 8Qs in a timely fashion, oh, so help you. That's going to be a very, very bad day. That's the same overall framework that's really in place now. But why don't we hear about it or care about it? Now, I would suggest that because it hasn't really been injected into the kind of current thinking of compliance and certifications and process at the highest levels of particularly publicly traded companies. So what changes? Well, let's point out a couple of things and then I'll kind of let it move on and we can come back to this. One of the biggest Has things- Has anything to do with the fact that nobody's had to pay a huge fine? Well, so there, there are four big things and I'll cover this a little bit more in the keynote as well, but Roman's main point is the most valid point, is until someone gets both a perp walk and a hundred million dollar fine, it's just not going to rise up, you know, onto the, you know, kind of current thinking of those who are the gatekeepers for formal compliance like the auditors. So that's the first reason. Second reason is the red herring of unauthorized employment. So if you do a read of the current bill, you realize the threshold for pattern and practice, the penalties for criminal behavior, you know, are, are all more serious. But most everyone in this room, I bet, and most people sitting in corporate offices say to themselves, I'm not that one. And that's probably true. 
right? It is unlikely that you're going to have a bunch of, you know, ICE folks kick down your doors, throw cuffs on you, and drag you away as people go bursting from your building, running away, afraid of getting caught, right? But that's one of the other reasons it doesn't show up, because we set it aside as, oh, I'm not employing anyone who's undocumented. But that's the point again, right? That isn't what the act requires. And finally, because there was no potential certification requirement that tied it formally to things like Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank. And two things. One, it didn't need a formal tie-in, because maybe, we'll hear in a minute the realities of this, maybe it should be a part of the certifications being put forth by CEOs and CFOs as a part of their representation to shareholders under Sarbanes-Oxley. Maybe. We'll debate about that. But more importantly, now under the bill, there is a process, and we will be posting this online, and it actually has page numbers to help people find things in the gigantic bill. Um, this ends up being page 42 to 46. It's a review of the penalties, but then further on, on page 480, let's see, 9 is it, I think? No, it's, four, it's on four, page 486. There is the reference to the employer compliance and then employer certification, which is the moment the way it's written. Um, the secretary has the ability to require that a company certify that they are, in fact, complying, not to certify that they don't have any unauthorized workers, but rather that they are engaging in the compliance process enumerated above. And once this starts to happen, once you have this idea of certification as represented by officers of the company, nothing focuses a board or a CEO or a CFO better than criminal or substantial civil penalties that accrue because they're signing a piece of paper you put in front of them. Trust me, your I-9 compliance process would be different if it elevated all the way to the CEO for signature every single time. I mean, it, it simply would, right? I mean, this, will, this causes them to turn to their general counsel, to sometimes call their personal outside counsel and say, I am signing this document, and it refers to things that say criminal penalties. Should I be signing this? And suddenly the whole compliance regime changes. So I think that's actually what is about to happen. I think the Senate bill certainly signals it. And um, I should point out that uh, the record keeping and verification practices penalties um, are heightened, of course, no, no surprise. But um, the number now for potentially accrued liabilities, if we continue the same rate of non-compliance, which I'll talk about during lunch, if we do that for five years under these new penalties, it'll exceed a trillion dollars of accrued liability, right? Now, whether or not anyone will ever act on that, eventually not acted on numbers if they get big enough, people actually do finally pay attention. You know, we've got $350 billion of accrued liabilities on the books of publicly traded companies in the United States um, for violations of current I-9s. And no one ever really worries about that yet because no big fine. But I think eventually that will change. And if it tips to a trillion dollars, at least the Wall Street Journal will write a little article or something, right? And then things will change. I think there are a couple of things I want to point out, which, which is if you push back and look historically at some of the um, case law that has evolved, we've got to look back to what kicked this all off, probably the Walmart case, which didn't even involve employees, direct employees of Walmart, but a cleaning company that Walmart hired, that the government deemed that Walmart officials, because they knew the cleaning company had hired unlawful, undocumented aliens, that they had responsibility, evolved to the IFCO case, where all of a sudden a pallet company, middle, ma middle line managers are facing criminal prosecution. Then take a look, and as Paul mentioned earlier, it was really done in a bifurcated um, uh, manner because it wasn't through an I-9 statute, but enforcement was done obliquely. Then you start looking at Chipotle, you start looking at, at uh, during the Obama administration, and, and we're looking at um, enforcement through OCAHO, where there are larger monetary fines. I was, consult I, I was talking to, to um, an M&A attorney, and I asked the question whether or not I-9 compliance ever came on their radar during their due diligence, and he said no. And I said, why? I said, you know, there is, if you take a look at the OCAHO cases, there really are ways to determine the potential liability exposure. And he looked at me and said, they don't want to know. And he said, if they don't know, it's not material. If they can't put a number to it, they, meaning corporations, if they don't put a number to it, then they don't have to worry about whether or not it's material. It's not until someone knocks on the door. I think what we're looking at, if you take a look, and as Dan mentioned, there will be a posting, because we, we did a markup, of the, took a look at the statute at, at, uh, at Senate 744, and looked at the provisions that apply directly to the employer. 
that have now, I suspect, I, I propose, has evolved this issue from proper, properly filling out a form to immigration compliance. If you take a look at page 475, there's a provision allowing for individuals and entities to file complaints. Guess what? That sounds like the whistleblower or akin to a whistleblower or a RICO, the whistleblower section of Dodd-Frank or a RICO complaint. And Chris, in fact, historically we know that in areas of kind of what you might deem um, high discretionary enforcement, um, y you find a pattern where arguably Dodd-Frank whistleblowing provisions cover the behavior around I-9 compliance, but no one's acted on it. We don't know of any whistleblowing in that space. It's still very early days. But the pattern we find in this high discretionary enforcement arena is that you will see several avenues of enforcement, whistleblowing showing up in several different types of bills which seem relatively unrelated but all give access to the same type of reporting and this is probably consistent with that and there simply comes a tipping point. So labor and employment and anti-discrimination, there are layers upon layers of different statutes, federal, state, different agencies and there are many access points to discriminatory behavior action on behalf of employees and others and it took an accumulation of several access points for it really to get traction in the late 80s and early 90s. So this is I think another signal that this is an entry point which is redundant. I mean that's the interest mark, it's redundant but once you have enough entry points there comes a tipping moment where corporates do start to get assailed because people notice at every turn, oh, I could report it this way, or this encourages me to report it. And that, I think, begs the question, do, at what point do the auditors change their mind about the point you made, which is materiality? I think that's the relevant question. Are we at a stage where maybe the outside auditor of a mid or large you know, publicly traded company says, yeah, you know what, this is now on my checklist for Section 404 for Sarbanes-Oxley, by and large, I don't think that's the case. And I didn't want to alter your flow, but I, I kind of wanted, I want to put these two guys on the spot in a way to tell us how come it doesn't come up, what will change that might make it come up more often. We're evolving. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the point to be made is for the first time, we're now also seeing criminal penalties written into a bill. So it's no longer just discretionary. Now the secretary has, can look to one bill and say, there is a violation and their criminal penalties. And this is actually in section uh, 3101L, criminal penalties. Roman, I th I'm going to turn to you. As, as you begin to hear the evolution of this I-9, this creature called I-9, and we're now looking at immigration compliance, what reaction do you have and what impact do you, do you believe this is going to have on corporations, and how would you advise corporations on going forward as to how to treat this topic? I've got, uh, I have answers to those questions, but our honored guest here, Rob Cooper from PricewaterhouseCoopers, has answers to the same question. I don't want to steal his thunder. I'm an old guy. Uh, I know how to teach. I'll pick up what he leaves out, but Rob, I think you should have the opportunity to go first. <laughs> okay. If you want me to go first, I will, but you're the honored guest. Um, let me give a little context from the point of view of an auditor. Um, you know, so, so um, you know, there's been mention of SOX, right? When we, as auditors, come in and we, we plan our audit, we have to think about what the standard refers to as likely sources of potential misstatement, right? So, um, and, and I'm not looking to minimize this topic in any way. It's a topic that deserves attention. But on, on certain of our clients, you know, they simply don't have enough employees that even high levels of noncompliance would be material in the context of an audit. And what I mean by that is, as auditors, we apply a kind of a rule of thumb, um, and many of you may already know this, um, in terms of how we assess materiality. So we start with 5% of pre-tax income, right? We then haircut that um, for, for detection risk and various other factors. And so we, we end up with about 3.75% of pre-tax income. Um, you know, for a company like a McDonald's or a Walmart that have many, many low-wage employees, this, this topic could be very relevant. And in fact, as we think about our audit and we plan our audit, you know, it could represent a likely source of misstatement and therefore it should get attention. We should be thinking about what controls does the company have. On other of our audits, 
and many of the clients I've served are in kind of the 500, mil 500 million to a, a billion dollars of revenue. They just wouldn't have enough employees. I mean, if you think about Silicon Valley companies, many of their employees are now overseas. They've outsourced their contract, you know, their manufacturing and so on. So they, you know, and even many of their engineers are now in low cost jurisdictions. So they're not in the U.S., right? Um, th the other thing I would add is, so, so there is a standard that we're subject to, an auditing standard. It's AU317, but it has to do with illegal acts. Um, and, and so noncompliance with this statute, if it becomes law, would be an illegal act as defined in that standard. Having said that, our, when we plan an audit, we don't plan an audit to necessarily detect noncompliance with, with all laws and regulations. We plan our audit around, you know, things that would materially impact a financial statement line item. So, for example, taxes we know are relevant. We plan our audit to spend significant, you know, to devote audit attention to taxes. If a company has pension plans here in the Valley, nobody has pension plans. But, you know, outside of Silicon Valley, companies have pension plans and they have to comply with, with those laws and regulations. But the law that we're talking about today is, is more of an indirect law. And so if you look at the standard, you know, we wouldn't necessarily plan our audit to, to devote attention to this. But, but I, I'd repeat what I already said, which is if, if we think this could represent a likely source of potential misstatement under SOX, we then need to think about it. So. Can I ask a, a, a follow-up question? If you think that we mentioned this before when we were chatting, so one of the things I was hoping is that the people in the audience could walk away with some rules of thumb, and it seems like you just laid the foundation for one, which is maybe you look at your clients if you're the outside counsel, or or you look at your company if you're inside, and you ask, what is the company's pre-tax income per I nine on an annual basis? In a way, just because you're trying to create this ratio where maybe they're a very large company, but they have massive turnover, and hence they're generating lots and lots of I-9s. So if they have 5 million I-9s, even if they have, you know, $500 million of pre-tax income, if they have a systematic error or problem, it's going to be a big deal. But on the other hand, as you mentioned, if, you know, they have 1,000 employees and they're a multi-billion dollar company, you know, it's just, it's just never going to hit the, you know, radar screen. So what do you think about creating some metrics like that so people can self-assess their potential risk for tripping up on materiality. I know that's not the only standard <laughs> practically, but for you. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that could clearly make sense. Um, you know, the, the other thing that, the, the other thing that I, I think we, we would do, you know, to, to be fair, this has not been on our radar screen, right? Just like it hasn't been on companies' radar screens. You know, I think, you know, we, we routinely sit down with in-house counsel and talk to them about claims and assessments and so on. Th this might be a topic that gets us into the VP of HR's office to have a discussion around, you know, how are you ensuring compliance with, with the I-9 requirements? Have you engaged any, you know, immigration counsel? Let's make sure we send a letter to immigration counsel. And I know we, we may get into yeah. what, what how counsel useless does with that those letters. Is, right? right? Um, so, so a metric like that could be, could be useful, um, but, but it's not something that we've to date done. Let me have a turn now and uh, give you the background uh, that Rob and I work with when we're talking about auditing and financial reporting here. And Chris mentioned FAST 5 in his introductory remarks. That's where I'm going now. Uh, I've been teaching accounting for 45 years. Accounting is the language of business. And I characterize my teaching as trying to tell people what terms and words have technical meanings and what do they mean and which ones don't. So I'm going to use a word that has a technical meaning only in the part of the country where I grew up, which is Alabama, roll tide, uh, and that is the word diddly squat, the term diddly squat. <laughs> it means not very much. It's a technical term in Alabama, but not here. It's just slang. I know diddly squat about immigration law, so let's get that on the table. That's why that came up. But I do know about the accounting rules for disclosing liabilities, potential liabilities. And this is FAST 5, and it is so counter to good economics that you wouldn't guess what the rule is if somebody didn't teach it to you. And you can spend several hours, several tens of millions of dollars hiring experts to deal with specific cases. But here's the basic idea. Uh, I want you to imagine your Nordstrom's, and you have escalators in every store. And a hundred people have injured themselves on your escalators. And each one of them is suing you individually for $10 million. And there's 
a 10 percent chance you're going to lose any one lawsuit. And let's assume these lawsuits are independent to make the statistics easy. Whether you win in uh, Stanford Shopping Center or not has nothing to do with whether you win or lose in the Seattle Shopping Center. So you've got a lawsuit for $10 million. You've got a 10 percent chance of losing. You might lose $1 million. Okay? But there's only a 10 percent chance. But if you've got 100 such lawsuits, and they're independent events, your expected economic loss is 10 percent of $100 million or $10 million. And there's some variation around that, but the statistical estimate is pretty good you're going to lose $10 million. The uh, international financial reporting standards essentially say that you have to accrue a liability of $10 million. That's not exactly what it says, but that's the economic intuition. In the U.S generally accepted accounting principle. In the audit rules that we use, the rule is this. Look at each one of those lawsuits independently. And unless it is probable you're going to lose, you don't record any liability. And unless it's, what's the term, reasonably possible that you're going to lose, you don't even disclose it in the notes. Uh, the accounting principles don't define what those probability levels are, but it, they've been around sufficiently long that I'll say that probable to an auditor means 75 to 80 percent or more, and reasonably possible 15 to 20 percent. So no one of those lawsuits rises to the level even of a disclosure, much less to a liability. And that's the rule that we deal with. And that's why this uh, I-9 liability and other liabilities uh, I'll talk about Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Dan knows the history better than I do, but I look to it for guidance about what's going to happen. The FCPA came into being in 1977. There was very little activity until uh, this century. And a guy who has an FCPA blog says, we have resurrected from uh, near illegal extinction the FCPA, and we're starting to have some lawsuits. It, take, it took, what, 25 years for that law to be on the books before people started paying attention. And we auditors, we accountants, are not going to be proactive about recognizing this. Maybe a whistleblower will alert us. Maybe uh, Rob's participation in this conference will turn on a light bulb at PwC that wasn't there. But sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry what? Sorry, sorry for causing that to happen. <laughs> well, no, he likes it <laughs> because it's, it's, no, well, it's more happy. employment. <laughs> yeah, it'll increase the income of accountants. We know that. Good point. Yeah, right. I'm trying to recruit not people sorry. into the accounting profession. Yeah, we, we want more, not less. So that's the basic uh, underpinning, the intuition of why it's an accounting problem that you don't see because of our rules in the U.S. And I, five years ago at a conference at Stanford, I predicted that the convergence of international and U.S. accounting standards would get the U.S. to where it needs to be, which is to the international place of using the expected value. But it's not coming anytime soon. The current management of both of those operation, uh, outfits is not real interested in that. So if you're cross-listed on like the Hong Kong Exchange or on Brazil's Bovespa that are using IFRS, you actually, the, the, that different rule would actually imply that you've got the probability issue and you would need to, re, you would need to disclose that probably. Is that right? Uh, if, if that stock exchange enforced and the security regulator in that country enforced, you got to follow IFRS in its purest form. But I don't know of a single jurisdiction that says that. I think they all allow exceptions. Now, I, and so I don't know. Uh, Rob may know about dual listings and whether that changes the FAS 5 to the IFRS version. And What's it, Rob, do you know about that? I don't know the answer, but okay. all I know is companies aren't rushing to adopt IFRS in the U.S. Yeah. Can I ask one, I want to tweak one question, then I'll hand it back to Chris here. It, so if, the Senate bill doesn't say this, but if the Senate bill ended up making a provision that went something like, you know, $50 million will be allocated to ensure the complete audit of current you know, I-9 compliance practices of the largest 2,000 companies in the United States over the next three years from the time the bill is enacted. So if it said something like that and it alters the expected probability fundamentally, so suddenly it goes to, you know, over the next three years, 100 percent, if you're one of those 2,000 companies, would that, would that prompt, and I ask this because it doesn't quite say that, but there are some implications in the politics around this, which are the fundamental compromises that the corporates end up really doing everything in their power to comply. And so if there was a clear statement that you were going to be audited and these liabilities would be exposed, does it change it under GAAP, under FAS 5? 
Well, you've got to be probable that you're going to lose a significant amount when they do it to you. Right? And not the fact they're just going to audit you. Now, you, you take as given, based on your research, that an audit will uncover tens of millions of dollars of liability. But that's not a given to the auditor at the start of this process. Rob, Rob's got some real-world experience well, no. to add to this. I mean, I, I, I don't want to jump ahead because we may get oh, to go this. Ahead. But, but one of the things we as auditors do is we, get, we, we solicit letters from lawyers, right? Um, and I'm just curious because, you know, one of the things in the agreement that was reached you know, back in 1975, is that the lawyer, I think, has an obligation to, to confirm that if they, in the professional judgment, have developed a point of view that something should be considered for disclosure, that they've advised their client of that fact. And, and I'm just curious now, listening to Roman take us through FAS 5, you know, do attorneys apply that same logic in terms of how they advise their clients, whether something is probable or whether something needs to be considered for disclosure. That's the lawyers. I, the lawyer's answer in part is we probably need to be educated more in terms of, of accounting vernacular and in terms of accountant's expectation. Oftentimes, if, if the liability is not staring us in the face, meaning there is no see, I, ice knocking on the door, there is no notice of inspection. There is no litigation pending. The answer is everything is fine. I think the question that we're going, we're evolving to, is what if, as an attorney, the client you have made a recommendation that that the the client have an independent audit, I nine audit conducted or they've even done an internal audit themselves and pr produced the records to you. And all of a sudden you're looking at a 90% absence of employer attestation. Now it's in your face and balls in your court. So I think, let me, let me push back for a minute. Let me ask Chris, is the you are in that hypothetical an internal general counsel person or an outside counsel? At the present time, well, you I, had I'm going to, I'm going to, Generally speaking, immigration attorneys outside counsel. Okay, and, and generally speaking, um, the, the, it may be the outside counsel making a recommendation to um, general counsel. Hey, have you done anything? What what has the company done relative to an I nine issue? So I, I think I'm going to push back for a second. Go back to the auditors and say. Give me an example of what you would be asking in that audit letter and give me the standards upon which you expect a response. And can we clarify the hypothetical a little because I really like it. So let's assume that you're outside counsel, you're specialized immigration outside counsel, the general counsel brought you in because they were at a uh, event and they talked about I-9s and they asked their HR person, their VP of HR, how are I-9s? And then she kind of said, well, you know, I don't know, that we do better than most, but I'm not sure. You've conducted, let's say, a spot audit. Let's say they're a big company. So they've got, you know, a half a million I-9s, you know, that they're keeping and you did a spot audit for 2,000 and you got a 90% substantive error rate, which you have reason to believe may be, you know, all the way through all those I-9s. So, it, it's publicly traded company, your outside counsel, this has been done arguably all appropriately such that you still probably have privilege, but you now have an indication that, you know, 90% of a half a million I-9s, if the correct agency showed up, and if that agency, you know, find to a reasonable maximum that they could, you probably have somewhere between 100 and $150 million of liability. Paul, Paul, why don't you chime in? I mean, it, it, as if I were to apply the virtue memo, memo in here, and I'm looking at potential pattern and practice and substantive violations, give me a ballpark. What am I looking at? Well, I, I just wanted to weigh in as a timekeeper in a large law firm, okay? And th this is how this issue comes to my attention you know, as, as many as three or four times a month at least, is, is that if we have a client who has a, an independent audit letter, um, then that, that the auditor is directed to, um, to make requests of people who are providing 
services to that company, including our law firm. And so the question is, do you, Baker McKenzie, first of all, do you have any fees that are unbilled or unpaid? Uh, that's one, I don't know. And, and our accounting uh, department answers, answers that part of the question. That, that's so we can make sure all fees have been properly accrued. Right, exactly. And, um, and the other question is, are there, I don't, I don't know the exact language, but are there un, um, unexecuted claims, unasserted, unasserted, unasserted asserted claims um, against the company, basically, in, you know, either civil or criminal? And, um, and w what we try to do is, is, is answer that question as a time, what I try to do is answer that question as a timekeeper, one of many within my law firm, by the way, but I'm looking at it for my small piece. And if we've done an audit and we have um, potential unasserted claims by DHS, I respond positively to our internal folks and somebody's making a judgment, presumably the auditor, about whether this particular unasserted claim is material or not material. That, that's typically how it arises in our situation. And I, I don't know how many people typically routinely get uh, audit letters, but, but I suspect that's how, that's how most of the firms are dealing with them. Uh, but I'm not making that judgment. Um, I'm, I'm just <laughs> responding and saying, here's, here's a potential. We've, we've done an audit. We have some potential liability here. Uh, unasserted, here's what it is, here's what we believe it is. Well, it, it, there, there's going to be two levels to respond here. First level is going to be, let, let's take it at, 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 at its face value. You've responded, you've, you've suspected that there's um, substantive violations, there could be a pattern and practice violation because, because of the fact that 90% absence of attestation on the employer's part, okay? You now report this to the auditor, the auditor's going to take a look and say, what does this mean? Probably going to call you up and say, what does this mean? Right? Right. So far, we're on track. Now I'm, gonna, now I'm an immigration attorney. I've got the virtue memo in my hand, and I begin doing computation. I begin looking at, at potential assessments. I look to the alcohol cases. I look at the formulas, and I come up with a number. I mean, is that, is that what the next process would be, or step us through. Rob, what would you go through? Well, I mean, I, I don't know enough about the bill, but I guess a, as the auditor, when I have that conversation with the attorney that, that provided the information, um, you know, I think I'd be asking if the company, the company now knows they're, they're not compliant. If the company were to take action to bring themselves into compliance, you know, how would that affect the potential <coughs> assessment? Right, and, and so I, th I think we'd have to have a fair bit of dialogue with outside counsel and with the company to assess, you know, do we under FES 5 have an accru accruable item? Do we at a minimum have some amount of disclosure? And even if we conclude that it's remote and so therefore it doesn't even go into the footnotes, should the company, at least in the 10K, think about a risk factor to, to at least have kind of something out there that companies from time to time are subject to these audits and it could result in a liability, right? So, so right. that would be the minimum, I think, they might put in. We should point out to Rob something that will be obvious to the lawyers who practice in this area, which is, to a certain extent, a lot of that liability that we described, the errors, are relatively non-mitigatable. So the particular type of error that he described is kind of a moment in time compliance failure, yeah. and it's not easy to go back and kind of fix it such that it's gone. Now, it, it varies widely, and we don't have to get into the details with, later on, a different session will. Um, but it, it, with that in mind, does that change? So, so even if you identified it now, that you know, half a million I-9s, you know, 450,000 of them have serious problems. Most of those problems can't go away. Can't be they mitigated. just sit there as a point in time. And if the right agency shows up with the right magnifying glass, they just start adding up numbers. And then you negotiate from there, of course. Right. Yeah. So, so even though it's non-mitigatable, I, I think the discussion would go into what you just said, which is, okay, we know we have a problem. We can't fix the past. It is what it is. We can take action to fix it going forward, and we hope we can negotiate something far less than what, what the penalty is called for, right? And so there, there would have to be a lot of dialogue with the company and with counsel to assess, you know, do we have something that should be disclosed? Do we have something that should be accrued, and what should be accrued? 
it goes back to, if I can re re go back for a second, that's why in the past it goes back to, if ICE isn't at the door, if, I haven't, if the client hasn't received a notice of inspection, if I'm not in litigation, I'm not in Oklahoma, I'm going to ignore it. Not necessarily the right answer. The dialogue that you're talking about, and, and what I'm gathering, my takeaway from this is, um, it's going, from an auditor's point of view, it's going to be reduced to a number. Is that correct so far? Yeah. What, I mean, what's we're, the we're number gonna be, exposure? We're going to be trying to reduce it to a number and assess whether it needs to be disclosed. And realize we're, you're, we're operating on the extreme edge. This is not the standard for good corporate conduct. This is, am I going to trip over material weakness issues with my external auditor? I mean, that's, that's kind of like saying, today we're all going to try not to break the law, right? No, no, that's not what we aspire to. We, we aspire to better. And so one point I would, point, I would make, and Rob, I'm curious as to your reaction to this, this conversation, in a way, if it occurs the way we just described it, puts on record the fact that these issues exist within the corporate environment, in a way they are discoverable under certain circumstances later on. And the reason I point that out is because from a corporate governance duty, ignore the actual audit standards, but let's just talk about what causes of action you'd have at the federal and state level as a shareholder. If you knew that 90 some percent of your current I-9s had the, it, nine out of 10 times, each I-9 was being produced and it was being produced in a way that it had a substantive non remediable violation. If you knew that was the case and you were an officer of the company or a director or sat on the audit committee or were an outside counselor in some way, you would have a clear fiduciary duty to report it because it's ongoing destruction of corporate value. It's technically corporate waste. I mean, way before you get to any of these other kind of audit issues, it's, it's as if you found someone bleeding in your hallway and you say, oh gosh, you know, look, lots of blood. Hmm. You know, you, you, you actually are obligated at a kind of basic duty level to stop the bleeding. So I, I point that out as maybe a different standard and, and I ask Rob and Roman practically, let's assume it's not quite so dire as we described or maybe it's not a publicly traded company. What are the reasonable steps that someone takes if they know that these are, there are these problems and they don't think auditors have been advised. I mean, do you always call your outside auditor? What about internal audit? I mean, I want less big red button panic solutions. Like external auditor, if you go back to your company and you say, hey, I, had this, I sat through this panel and they said, we should immediately contact our external auditor about X, Y, and Z. If you're talking to your CFO, they're gonna like, you know, back you into a corner and lock you in the closet and not let you out for a little while. So what other lesser dramatic steps are there today? Well, the companies are supposed to have an uh, internal own budget kind of thing, a whistleblower thing, where you can report stuff without fear of retaliation. I don't think in practice that works real well, but that's sort of the textbook answer, is start with your internal control inside your company, because that function is supposed to be under the control of the board of directors, not the CFO, and the uh, independent internal audit person is uh, there to work on these things. I don't know, what I can't tell in practice is how often that person is independent and there are no retaliations. You hear about the retaliations in the press, you don't hear about the quiet ones where things work the way it's supposed to. I don't know if Rob has any insight whatsoever on how internal reporting works. Well, I, I think Dan makes a good point in that, you know, if you are at a company or you're external counsel to a company and, and you guys have reason to believe that, that the company needs to do something to assess its exposure, you know, before you pick up the phone and call the external auditor, they certainly could, you know, go to their internal audit department. They could, you know, you know, get together with HR and they could do their own assessment, right? Because if they call me and they say, geez, we might have all this exposure, you're still going to have to go through that process to assess the exposure. So, so I think that might be the place to start and then go to the auditor if you think you have an issue. The external auditor. I, I, I think the takeaway is... Um, and, and the question going to the external auditor is, where's the threshold? What's the point? I mean, what, what, at what point do you push that panic button? At what point must, is someone going to push it? And, and I think that the next um, iteration of, of our discussion is going to be tying in the Senate bill into, into what the scenario we're talking about. Because I, I think part of the solutions we've been discussing are under is, is what's happening under existing law. Um, Paul, let me bring you back in. I mean, as, as we begin to overlay and interweave the, the Senate bill, how do you think 
that the the the, the uh, impact and the employer sanctions and the and the immigration compliance requirements are going to play into this scenario. Do we want to put the uh, yeah. the slides up? I don't have the little clicker there. I think oh, you do. I Dave. do. I did. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. Good. Everybody like the rear view mirror uh, look up there? <laughs> We're going to have to look in the rearview mirror to see what uh, is is happening in front of us. But um, just in general terms, the um, let's see, I'm on the wrong. Let me get the right PowerPoint up here. One thing that we know is if, if this bill becomes law, the employers are going to be required to comply with, register for and comply with the requirements of the system, what is called the system, which we know is E-Verify today, uh, which is going to be a, an obligation over and above what is in place today for most employers. E-Verify is voluntary, and so it's going to become mandatory, and in becoming mandatory, Congress isn't just saying you need to register for E-Verify for this system and comply with it. There are certification requirements, there are penalties associated, not just with failure to complete the I-9 or complete the I-9 properly, but failure to use the, um, uh, the, the system, as it's called, and also failure to, um, to address issues when you get a, a tentative non-confirmation from the system or a non-confirmation from the system and dealing with the individual employee. So you have... Um, obligations with respect to employees that you're not using the system uh, in a discriminatory fashion, for example. So you have compliance issues with respect to the system itself and also with respect to the, um, the immigration-related discrimination provisions of the statute uh, in, a, in addition to that. Well, the questions that, a couple of questions, I will, yeah. A couple of questions that um, we have are, okay, how are audits going to be handled in this? We talked about it this morning. It's a two- to four-year period, depending on the size of the, uh, of the employer. Um, and then once they are implemented, um, is this system going to be um, robust enough and accurate enough to reduce the employer's risk with respect to... Um, the hiring or continuing knowingly employing uh, unauthorized workers. Until we have mandatory E-Verify across the board, in addition, I should say to um, the, the two to four year implementation period, um, uh, the, the secretary may also direct employers to comply with the system if it will, if it is required in the secretary's view to protect critical infrastructure. So um, we already have it in place for certain federal government contracts. Uh, we will have it in place in a mandatory basis on a phased in basis, but also if, it's, if it is required to protect critical infrastructure, um, then the secretary can require employ employers in those particular fields uh, to uh, comply with the, uh, the system as well. Um, the, the ICE best empl employment practices, which uh, are listed on the ICE website in terms of um, one of the things they, they um, ICE um, suggests is that there be a, um, that an employer use the E-Verify system, so that's still going to be relevant it, it, while it remains uh, voluntary. Um, copying of, of documents is something that ICE recommends. It's not, it's, that is also voluntary and not required, uh, with the exception of the, if, if a, an employer is using E-Verify, and in those states in which E-Verify is required, certain documents must be photocopied and maintained, primarily passports and, uh, and green cards and work authorization documents um, currently. Um, Audits, independent audits, will continue to be a requirement, uh, and not a requirement, but a suggested best, best practice uh, by ICE until E-Verify is, is um, uh, made mandatory, the system is made mandatory. Um, the penalties for uh, pattern and practice violations take place, actually 
prior to the implementation of E-Verify. So employers, uh, these are stepped up penalties. So the increase in penalties for both for pattern and practice and civil penalties uh, will take, a, take effect even prior to uh, implementation of the mandatory system. Paul, may I ask a question of the auditors related to mm -hmm. that? So does it fit into the regime of how you evaluate risks this big reputational risk if somehow a failure of compliance tips into a criminal act and the kind of the, you know, whether it's the Chipotle story or a, or a American Apparel story, does that, does that show up on how you evaluate certain risks? Because I-9 I noncompliance does have an unusual feature, which is there's kind of this transition from civil to over time, if you meet the pattern of practice, you have these now what will be significant felony criminal acts. And does that, I don't know how you factor that in. Maybe you don't. Maybe it's too hard to factor well, in. Well, I mean, we, we do, you know, when we accept a client, we do kind of acceptance procedures. On an annual basis, we do kind of reassessment procedures. So if there were, you know, if it became a criminal act, clearly it might play into how we think about working with that company. But, you know, this is, this is an area where, I, I mean, it would depend on the facts and circumstances of the noncompliance, right? I mean, if, if, if the company really just paid no attention and, and got sideways with this and then had these, these criminal penalties, you know, then, then maybe it plays into the, the, you know, the ethics of the, of the management team and whether we want to be associated with that company. There's been uh, an implied assumption in this discussion is that this outside immigration lawyer is going to tear this problem. I was under the impression that they clam up and don't tell us that there's a potential problem. How can you compel them to talk to you in these meetings? I don't think you can. I, I think that's a fair point. I mean, I, I've, I've never seen or heard of a, a letter that raises this issue. Now, there may be companies, I mean, you know, you've pointed to examples with Walmart and Chipotle, so there may be, there may be a population of companies out there where it has shown up, but I think it's pretty rare. But it didn't come first to the auditor yeah. through this attorney letter right. from the immigration. And, right. and so what you're saying is, though your practice is fairly broad and you've been at this for a while, you haven't seen this come to you in response, for example, to a letter. It hasn't come to you through the normal channels in terms of we have this I-9 compliance problem. Right. I mean, I, I will tell you, as we were working to identify somebody to be on this panel, that we didn't have uh, a, a bench of experts or a bench no. of people who had dealt with this issue. So let me survey the crowd. How many people are practicing immigration lawyers right now? So you may put down your hand if, no, no, keep it up, keep it up. You can put down your ha hand if after having performed a spot audit, uh, none of your clients had any substantial double digit violation patterns within their I-9s. Okay, just checking, all right. No, so it, it's an interesting mismatch and I think this, it's the unique part of this panel to a certain extent then we'll let Paul continue, which is it, it, for those who practice in this space, they come into contact with very, what I would describe as ethical, you know, by the book companies, publicly traded, hardworking, you know, doing a great job in every way. So these aren't meat processors. You know, these are just like the, you know, companies that we read about in the paper and we are glad they're doing well. And consistently those companies, even those companies have, what I would describe from our practice, practitioner viewpoint, substantial numbers of problems in their I-9s. It's all relative, so maybe they're better than their neighbor, but it's not a 5% error rate. It's not a 10% error rate. It is, and we'll talk about this at the keynote, you know, it's a 30 to 40% error rate. I mean, consistently. And that's, you know, that, that's just, and that's a, a company that's working hard to get it right. So anyway, it, it's, it's an interesting mismatch that it just doesn't ever, yeah. Show up to you. I mean, I, 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 the point's not lost that, I mean, we, you know, when these, lo when the letters go out to lawyers, um, typically the company does not provide a list of potential claims and assessments, right? So they leave it completely up to the lawyers to respond. And generally speaking, if the lawyers haven't devoted significant attention to it, they're not going to comment on it. Um, I don't know what they would do if they had devoted attention and thought it was an issue and they didn't know how to respond. So. I just haven't been part of that issue, that process. Let me ask the question. Of all the lawyers who have conducted the audits, how many have received an audit letter? How many respond? How many respond that there's a problem? Yeah, now that this is, yeah, I, as your counsel, I advise you not to raise your hand and answer these questions. <laughs> <laughs> the camera's high enough. It's okay. They won't see you. Well, this is relevant because I think 
Paul's next point about best practices around audits, right? I mean, it, the, 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 one of the best practices in this space, and I think you're about to make the point that it continues to be so, is for outside counsel or others, for companies to engage experts to help them assess you know, how they're doing along the way. And so I, I, I just wanted to tease that out before you made that point, which I think is, is still a very valid point. Well, that's right. Not only is it going to continue to be important, but it's going to become even more important because what, what Congress is doing here is they're not just tinkering around with the employer sanctions section of the, the law, section 274A, they're replacing it wholesale. It, and so, and it's over 100 pages long. If you look at the bill, I think it's like 125 or so. Um, Section 274A is amended to read as follows. So it's not just, you know, we're, we're amending a section here, a section there. Everything is, is a, 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 an entire new structure is being dropped in. Now, that doesn't mean every single aspect of 274A is being changed, um, but there are increases in penalties. Um, the, but the substantial uh, change here is that there's going to be an elect, uh, if this bill were to pass, um, employers are going to be obligated na nationwide to register and comply with a whole new system, the electronic verification system, whatever it's going to be called. It's called the system in the bill. And that, Im that imposes additional requirements over and above what employers are required to do today, other than on the basis of a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Homeland Security. So employers who are registered have certain obligations in terms of how they comply with E-Verify. For example, you can't use E-Verify uh, in a discriminatory fashion. You can't E-Verify some new hires and, and not other new hires. So that already exists for anybody who's registered under, under E-Verify. This bill will, inc will <laughs> impose additional compliance requirements um, on employers just by virtue of the of the automated system and so you know at, within our firm when we look at these issues we look at them sort of holistically uh, in terms of compliance we look at it from a white collar criminal um, perspective um, the same way we look at FCPA and some of the other issues you know and, and we ask our clients do you have a compliant? Do you have a program in place for compliance with this? In addition to to your other issues, it's it's you have to put it into context. It's a piece of the overall compliance that is what keeps general counsels up at night. Um, you know, among you know the other compliance tax and and a whole host of other issues that uh, the companies are, are are dealing with. So that's. That's how to, we, we sort of put it into, uh, into context. And what Congress is doing here is, is taking that already a fairly significant compliance requirement on the behalf of employers and, and doubling it, if you will, by imposing a new system on top of the, the old system. They're not taking the old system away. They're, they're imposing a new requirement on top of it. So that's why we're, we're even having this, question, this discussion about um, uh, worksite enforcement and, and what, what, Im, what uh, requirements are going to be imposed on new em, employer, I mean, on employers under this bill if it, uh, if it passes. Uh, just quickly then, the, um, uh, Sharon, did you have a question? That, uh, uh, Chuck's before me. So. Oh, Chuck. I just, I just wanted to intercede. Uh, your firm had the experience of the IFCO, uh, uh, defending the IFCO prosecution, and you did so well with it. And it just reminds me that, that sometimes the, um, the bad news doesn't come in traditional ways. I think IFCO, uh, it was a result of local police prosecutions uh, in the area and then reporting to the agency. The, the question I had was, what if in benefits management, uh, outside counsel or, or even HR manager calls you and says, hey, and, and by the way, your, your client is a FAR contractor with the risk of debarment. Uh, in our benefits management, uh, you know, uh, the specialist who, who deals with our tickle system has uh, been out of the office for a month and forgot, and the tickle system uh, didn't get tickled this month. And what happened was we had five different uh, people on temporary permits 
that, that didn't get renewed, but we kept them on the payroll and we just discovered it. The FAR contractor risked debarment for a knowing violation, and suddenly HR has called you with five separate instances of a knowing continuing to employ violation. Immigration lawyers would say, hey, that's just section three. The FAR contractor counsel says that's a, that's a real ostensible risk of knowing continuing to employ violations on our books. What do we do? It's a good question, Chuck. <laughs> I'm, I'll, um, I'm going to send you an engagement letter. When you get it in the mail, you can review it. It tells you how we bill you for these kind of things. <laughs> <laughs> there are certain provisions. Oh, oh I see. Uh -huh. um, well, I, you know, I think that was the um, even worse. I, I think that was what was involved in, in the law firm that got the call from Abercrombie & Fitch when uh, Abercrombie & Fitch's entire system for completing I-9s uh, was, was found to be out of compliance. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I, you know, we can go through how to, how to deal with that, but it, it, it raises a number of compliance issues. I, I, I think the fact that the, the company is a FAR contractor, and a lot of companies inside the Beltway are certainly FAR contractors and are subject to the, the FAR clause, which, uh, you know, we, t we keep talking about this FAR clause, but the Federal Acquisition Regulation was amended to require that federal government contractors uh, comply with, uh, register for and participate in the E-Verify system if the prime contract includes the, the clause that requires that. Um, I think it just ups the ante. I mean, it, it, it just makes, not only is that particular employer facing paperwork, potential unauthorized, is paperwork, uh, potential unauthorized employment um, uh, fines, but also, as you mentioned, debarment. Um, you know, I mean, first of all, you have to, you, are you sure it's only five? You know, let's take a look at the system. How long was it down? What, what, uh, how many I-9s were affected? Um, did it affect new hires during that period of time as well? Um, you know, and you have to go back and you have to give an explanation of, as to why E-Verify wasn't conducted within three business days of, first of all, you have to do the re-verification, then you have to explain to E-Verify why uh, the verification wasn't done within the three business days as are required by the, um, the E-Verify. And, um, you know, you have to prepare the client for the potential of, of an enforcement action. Um, if it was really inadvertent, then I, then I think, you know, I, I, I believe we'd have arguments to make that why debarment shouldn't apply in, in a situation like that. Um, but, but all the risks that you talk about are real and substantial risks. I guess the question is, just bringing it back to this panel, is that something the auditors should know about? Yeah, so yeah, maybe for Rob and Roman, if there was a company that derived 30% of its revenue from federal contracts and the lawyers determined that there was a possibility that they would get debarred under this clause, which would mean they could no longer generate revenue from those contracts immediately, mm -hmm. what, what would you hope that the company and or those counsel reported to you and what might be the action? You're, you're suggesting that by, by debarred you mean they would not be able to they would lose 30% of their revenue. Yes, that's right. I mean, they clearly have an obligation to tell the marketplace that they're about to lose 30% of their revenue, right? So it's, it's beyond well, an audit right. issue. There's a step before that. There's a potential that they right. might be debarred. Yeah. So it's a risk factor, and it's yep. still remote. Right. And it's still not disclosed. They hire good enough lawyers, maybe not. Right. right. I, mean, um, I think we're the last ones to the party. We, we are. We're out front. The, we're the, not. You know, we've talked about lawyers' letters. The other thing to keep in mind here is we get these letters shortly before the 10K is filed, <laughs> right? We, we time it that way so that it's, you know, it's current. But raising an issue three days before the 10K is filed is not the timing <laughs> we'd want to deal with, right? So, so to some extent, that, that letter will be helpful, but that may not solve the problem. I mean, counsel in-house and external counsel may need to be more proactive in going to the auditors than waiting to send them a letter and saying, you know, guess what? Sure. 
Um, I just wanted to mention about those audit letters. You know, I represent a lot of public companies and I do receive a lot, but I'm also always surprised about the ones I don't receive. And I think the reason you don't see a lot of it is because corporate immigration attorneys often are not considered important on the list, which is why it doesn't come up in M&A. Um, and when I read those audit letters, it talks about any unasserted claims. So I don't feel that I have the right to make a determination if it's important or not. So I've done one or of two things. Usually I call the company and I ask them when I know of something. And usually it's not a substantive error. It's the knowingly hire and continuing to employ. I've done an audit or they've called me and said, we have someone who's undocumented. We were hiring them. I don't feel that I can't put that in an audit letter. So sometimes I will call them and ask them, what do they want me to do? And they will say, we don't want you to disclose it. In those cases, I have sometimes not responded because I can't find anything out there in bar rules or otherwise that legally require me to respond. But if I do respond, then what I've done is said, I do have knowledge of things, but I believe they're covered by attorney-client privilege. And if you want to have the details, please let me know. And I've never had an auditor come back. Because I agree with Dan, I think that you know if I disclose it in there, it's a problem as well. But it's not the case that companies don't know. They're well aware. They don't want us to tell the auditors. So I've had many clients. I've actually been fired by a client for responding to the audit letter with the truth. So to back up Sharon on this, I make a point of talking to outside counsel and then inside point person, often counsel, but not always at as many publicly traded companies as I can find. And this is the dominant answer, nine out of ten times. Yeah. Which should, does this trouble you, Rob? It's a problem. Well, this is <laughs> I mean, I, I can't tell you what your professional obligation is. From your perspective. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, that would have to be, you'd have to make that assessment under the ABA statement of policy that, that you know, addresses lawyers' letters. Um, and we've posted that online, so we got what, the But what troubles me is more that, that potentially our clients are suggesting to you it doesn't need to be disclosed, nor are they disclosing it to us, right? Because if, if, if things do go sideways, um, you know, we'll be pulled into the lawsuit in all likelihood, but, you know, we will have a defense, um, and I, I just think everybody would be better off to, to put it on the table and work through it, as opposed to hope it will go away. I, I have a question that just kind of goes with Chuck's a little bit in terms of how that information gets to you. If We've had exactly this situation where the E-Verify was being violated for our contractor. We determined that we, they didn't have to make a disclosure E-Verify, because E-Verify policy at that time was you've got to just be in compliance and fix yourself. That was what would happen. But we ended up disclosing it in a, um, a, a, dec a mandatory disclosure uh, under the procurement contract, um, which was a little shaky, because that goes automatically to the um, inspector general for the agency that was the, uh, the procurement uh, end industry at the other end. And we knew about it. We put it in uh, the, the audit letter. But if you're getting, if the client's getting, uh, the company's getting letters from all different people, do you ever get those, or is it just what they get together? Because if you've got a procurement person telling you one thing and the lawyer's subject matter telling you something different, I would imagine that might give you some concern about what's being disclosed. I'm just curious, does it all get wrapped up by the company first and then they give you the data? Um, or do you ever get an opportunity to see what was given internally? I mean, the standards that we apply require that we, that the company sends the letter to, to the attorneys, but the letter needs to come directly to us. So it, it shouldn't be going back through the company and the company, you know, deciding which letters they're going to share with us and not share with us. Um, so so if, if, if you guys respond, it should be coming directly to us, the auditors. Holy. Yeah, Chris, if I can just go through the... Um Um, just to, to finish up in terms of the gang of eight bill and, and w what changes what changes we're looking at in terms of this whole question about audits um, identity theft we've talked about that pretty substantially today I don't need to tell you I guess that th this bill doesn't solve that um, it, it, it is going to continue to be uh, an issue uh, as Doris said we're, we're not going to have an official national identification card it's just not on the table at all of course, the unofficial national identification card is the Social Security card, but we all know how secure that is. 
Um, so it, it's going to continue to be an issue that we're going to have to deal with, that employers are going to have to deal with because the, the uh, focus is on them. A couple of the things that the bill does, though, is it allows the individual employees to lock their Social Security number in the E-Verify system uh, so that it can't be used again until the person unlocks it for the next job that they, they apply for. So it's, it's one measure of trying to protect the Social Security numbers. There's also a provision that allows the, uh, the system or the, the, the secretary um, working in consultation with the Commissioner of Social Security to lock uh, Social Security numbers that are suspected of being abused in the E-Verify system. Um, until they can be addressed with the individual employees. So a couple of measures there to try to bring some security into the, uh, the identity, theft, or identity theft arena. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, I think, but, but we're only dealing, we're dealing with um, secure identity documents that are issued by the federal government, but only those um, driver's licenses and other state-issued documents that are coming from states that have agreed to participate in the program. And so we're, go we're gonna have a situation still where we're gonna have some states that do, some states that don't. Um, it, it's, you know, we don't have Congress mandating to the states that they develop a particular um, driver's license, a protected driver's license. And, and um, I, I suspect that if that were in here, it would probably be considered potentially unconstitutional and would, would certainly raise uh, some issues. The um, uh, bottom line is, okay, what, what, do we, what can we expect from the audit context? As I mentioned, the ICE best practices in terms of doing external independent audits will continue to be a best practice. Um, uh, copying of documents, um, using E-Verify obviously will be, uh, will come off the list because that's going to be mandatory across the board. Um, but the other ice best practices are going to continue to be to be relevant. Um, it, the compliant the compliance program is going to have to ensure that there is compliance not only with the I nine requirements but also with the the um, electronic verification system requirements as well. So so both of those things we're basically doubling the obligation on the uh, part of the the employer as I mentioned, um, and then. What we're talking about here is risk-based auditing is, is going to continue to be an important uh, issue here in terms of identifying those unasserted claims or, or asserted claims that rise to the level of, of reporting. And it's going to be, as Rob and, and Roman have mentioned here, a risk. It's going to continue to be a risk analysis. Uh, we just have new obligations built that we're going to have to uh, keep an eye on. Any questions? I should mention why, while he's making his way is that the sentencing guidelines are going to continue to be very informative in here. And I haven't had a chance to look specifically at the direction Congress is giving to the Sentencing Commission uh, in the bill, but there is some language in there in terms of congressional direction of the Sentencing Commission in, in this particular area. So. Um, we'll, we'll have to learn more about that. And obviously, we're, we're dealing, we just, we have to remember, we're dealing with a bill that's only been introduced in the last couple of days. It's not the law, and uh, it, it bears um, mentioning that uh, it's certainly not something that employers have to uh, comply with today. In terms of uh, audits, are um, uh, verification, e-verification, et cetera, to what lower level of subcontractors, supply chain of subcontractors, does it apply to a company when audit is done by audit company or, or in terms of regulation by an e-verify process? So I have a, one contractor, you know, as long as that one contractor happens to be an American citizen or a legalized uh, uh, immigrant and signs and says, yeah, I don't have any problem, do I just take it as it is, or how do we, do we have to go through the supply chain continuously from an organic perspective or regulation perspective? And most importantly, liability. At the bigger level corporation, what are the liability issues? Is the supply chain, something happens, someone did not verify. 
let me restate it and maybe have you know, either uh, Paul or Chris answer that in brief because we're running out of time. So it, it, can you give us just a quick insight into whether or not the bill as proposed or the current law really gives you a dodge if you engage in kind of fancy shenanigans around building, you know, relationships with, you know, companies, engaging subcontractors, just so you kind of distance yourself from, you know, the, the knowingness of it all. And, and I'm curious maybe, because I didn't come across it, does anything get stronger in the current law? Can you address that just briefly Paul, for everyone? Paul, do you want to take it first? Well, I, I, I think it's also an audit question in terms of, you know, you're sending an audit letter out to, or the company's sending an audit letter out to its vendors. What are the obligations on the part of those vendors to make sure that their subcontractors, that they are reaching out to their subcontractors to get the information? So I'm, I'd be interested to hear from Rob and Roman uh, about that. But just in terms of... Um, for example, the FAR obligations for federal government contractors, um, that it, it goes all the way down. So each contractor in that chain is obligated to impose the clause, the FAR clause, in its contract. And that goes all the way down as far as you want to go. If you have 10 levels of, of subcontractor, each of those contracts has to have the FAR clause unless one of the, it, it gets down to one of the exceptions, um, you know, it, below a certain dollar level or it's commercial off-the-shelf product that, uh, that you know, it's, it's not related. So judgments are being made by contractors all the time, whether to include the FAR clause or not include the FAR clause in their subcontracts. I think if you're looking at trending, you're certainly looking at a trending that's being more conservative and a trend that's pushing more responsibility on employers. I think if you take a look and, and, and at the Walmart case and you use that as precedent, the reality is that the employer cannot t turn around and just say, he's a subcontractor, I have no responsibility there. I think you're going to be looking at a standard of knowing and so if you have a, a, a middle-level manager who knew or should have known, um, I, I think the responsibility, the employer is not going to be able to just shirk the responsibility of saying, but he's a subcontractor. I had this issue come up by uh, one of our uh, clients raised a question with me about whether, um, <laughs> whenever I was with the Immigration Service, I did for the first five years federal government contract uh, work as well, so we had to handle bid protests and all, all sorts of that, so had some background on it. But the question was, is what we're providing under this contract a commercial off-the-shelf product such that we're not obligated under the, under the FAR clause? And my answer was, you know, I took a look at it and I said, you know, it, it really does look like commercial off-the-shelf product, although there might be some, um, you know, specific aspects of this that are, that are um, where you're tailoring the product to a particular um, client. And, and, and that gets to be a very difficult question to answer unless you're really steeped in, in government contracts. But my bottom line response was, if you feel that this is a commercial off-the-shelf product, you need to convince your prime contractor that the FAR clause does not belong in your contract. And if they're not prepared to go back to the agency, ultimately, and make that argument on your behalf, you're going to, you, you know, you, you might as well sign up for E-Verify because, um, you know, and, and maybe that you know, Prime isn't prepared to do that. So um, those are some of the issues that, um, that come up from time to time. I don't know if anybody else has had that question <laughs> arise to them, but I, we certainly have. But I think we're out of time. Um, I think what we will do is, uh, I'll let Chris wrap up maybe with a final comment, but I just want to tell you what we're doing. Lunch is served right out and back, but uh, you have 15 minutes to grab it and come back in because we're not letting you rest. Uh, we're going to do a working lunch, and to tease you, I have a... I have a new data set from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which I'm not going to distribute because I'm not supposed to be distributing it yet, though I have it. So you'll have breaking news from Bureau of Labor Statistics, so don't miss the first five minutes of the presentation. But uh, so grab your lunch and then come right back. And I note that there are 10 people in chairs in the back. There are 11 open seats at tables, but it will require that you sit 
near the front. So, you know, it's okay. Chris, any thoughts? Thank you, everybody. Uh, I want to thank my panel. It certainly is a... a um, Enlightening perspective to be able to understand and, uh, what the auditing process is and the requirements are. Thank you.